Hey guys and gals, or well, mostly guys, Happy New Year! It sure has been a while, but in today's episode we'll go over physics, collisions with a broad phase swept AABB algorithm, and global socio-economic struggles since the late 19th century. Quickly before the tutorial though, Jack and Drakeev on my Discord server have been hard at work adding a bunch of new features to a new community subdirectory of the repository, including but not limited to, music playback, lighting and ambient occlusion, gamepad support, translucency, a day-night cycle, and a debug overlay. So check that out if you're interested. You can also submit really any new features you'd like as a PR. This directory is intended for everything experimental and fun. Also, in the source code for this episode in the GitHub repo, I've included this small parkour map which you can use to experiment with different values and test your physics and collisions. I made a bit of a last minute decision to split this episode into two parts as it was getting a bit unwieldy long, but the second part about physics is coming very, very soon. Sorry for the relatively long intro. To start things off, let's create a new entity class. Physics and collision handling will more than likely be common between the player and entities other than the player, so it will be useful to make an entity class from which the player class inherits. This entity class will contain basic stuff such as the position, rotation, velocity, width and height of the entity, which we can default to the dimensions of a player. It will take in the world objects as an argument for a little later. Then we can turn our previous camera class into a player class which inherits from entity, and now, instead of adding to the position on input, we're going to want to set the velocity instead. This velocity will constantly be added to the position in an update function in entity. Don't forget to call that update function and change all instances of camera to player. Things should work as before, except now, ah, we're floating away. We can temporarily fix this by setting the velocity to zero so that we stop if it's not actively being set. Now comes what to me is the most dreaded part, implementing collisions. Mostly, try to visualize them in two dimensions first, as once you understand collisions in 2D, switching to 3D is generally just a matter of extending the same logic into an extra dimension. As a quick crash course on collisions, there are two main parts we need to work on, collision detection and collision response. If we imagine a ball and a wall, collision detection would be verifying if the wall and the wall actually touch or intersect, whereas collision response would be figuring out how to move this ball so that it's no longer intersecting with the wall. In real life, you could conceptualize this as the ball bouncing against the wall. Let's assume time is split into individual discrete steps as it is in the context of computer simulations such as ours. Our ball moves in a certain direction a certain amount each step following some velocity vector. Notice the difference between the terms velocity and speed. Velocity refers to the rate of change of distance in a direction, whereas speed refers only to the rate of change. Now, you might imagine collision detection to be relatively trivial, and well, it kind of is. Just check every step if the ball has intersected with the wall, right? Well, this is where collisions come in to shatter your hopes and dreams. What if our ball was actually moving like really, really fast? What happens if during a step, we actually overshoot the wall? Fiddlesticks, then no collision would be detected and the balls would just phase through the wall and burn like witches. The name for this phenomenon is tunneling, and it's enough to instill fear into anyone who's tried implementing collisions themselves. The solution to this is what's known as continuous collision detection, or CCD, as opposed to discrete collision detection, or DCD. With CCD, we look for each step at the velocity vector 2, and use some algorithm to determine whether or not our ball intersected with the wall at some point between two steps, and the algorithm we're using to do this is known as swept AABB. AABB stands for Axis Aligned Bounding Box, and all that means is that our physical objects are axis aligned. Basically, our objects are all boxes in space which have no rotation, which is conveniently exactly what Minecraft is made of. This greatly simplifies the math, and often it's all you really need to pull off acceptably convincing collisions, even in games which aren't necessarily built of boxes. Create a new collider class for handling AABBs, which will have two coordinates, one for the negative xyz vertex and the other for the positive xyz vertex of our box. We can say that adding a position vector to this collider object moves both its coordinates by that same amount. We can also say that taking the set intersection between two colliders tells us whether or not they're intersecting. I'm going to do this by overloading the set intersection magic function dunder and dunder. This isn't too difficult, just get the overlap between the intervals of both coordinates of both colliders on each axis and see if all of them are positive. This shouldn't be too hard to reason about if you pause and ponder and convince yourself that what I just said is actually true. Okay, so back to swept AABB. Honestly, there isn't too much information about the algorithm online at all, but it's a method of CCD in which we figure out the time it takes for a moving collider to enter and exit a static collider. That's actually what the word swept refers to. A sweep test is a moving versus static collider test. Once we have this entry time for each static collider, we'll then be able to sort each potential collision by time and take the first one that occurred and respond to that one. Okay, so let's think about what time means. The information we've got right now are the positions of the moving and static colliders, which we can use to get a distance, and a velocity vector. We know that velocity is change in distance over change in time, so we can conclude that to get time, we should divide the distance 
distance by the velocity. You might be tempted to take the absolute value of the velocity here, and yeah, that's a good intuition to have, but let's hold off on doing that just now. You'll see why in a bit. Let's create our collide function. To make things a bit easier for the following bit, I'm going to assume the only component of our velocity vector is its x component. So, to get the entry and exit time, we now know we need the entry and exit distance. This is relatively easy to reason about if you imagine what distance the moving collider travels before it enters a static one. We can quite visually see that for each component, the entry distance will be x1 of the static collider here, subtracted by x2 of the moving collider. We follow a very similar reasoning for the exit distance, where this is the distance travelled by the moving collider before it exits the static one, which works out to be x2 of the static collider, subtracted by x1 of the moving collider. But we mustn't forget that the velocity can also be negative. By using the same logic as when it was positive, we can now work out that the entry distance is x2 of the static collider, subtracted by x1 of the moving collider, and the exit distance, x1 of the static collider, subtracted by x2 of the moving collider. And this is also why we didn't take the absolute value of the velocity previously. If we now divide these distances by the velocity, assuming the zero case is taken care of, let's try to think about a variety of different cases. One, the velocity is positive and the static collider is to the right of us. Both distances are positive, and so divided by the velocity, we get a positive entry time, which signifies we'll collide in the future, and so the collider is in front of us. Two, the velocity is positive, but the static collider is to the left of us. Both distances are negative, and so divided by the velocity, we get a negative entry time, which signifies we may have collided in the past, but certainly won't collide in the future, and so the collider is behind us. Three, the velocity is negative, and the static collider is to the left of us. Both distances are negative, and so divided by the velocity, we get a positive entry time, which, again, signifies we'll collide in the future, and the collider is in front of us. All this seems to make perfect sense and to work out, but what happens when the static collider is well in front of us, but too far away for any collision to occur? Well, to answer this, we want to know if the entry distance is greater than the velocity. Since we'd like to express this in terms of the entry time, let's divide both sides by the velocity, and we discover that, if the static collider is beyond where our moving collider will be in the next step, the entry time will be greater than 1, and there is no collision. Also, as we just saw, if the entry collision time is less than 0, it means the moving collider would have collided with the static collider in the past, which means that it's behind us, which obviously means that there's no collision. Okay, cool, we're nearly done. Just extrapolate this to each component. If you're wondering why we're even allowed to do this in the first place, it's thanks to what's known as the SAT, or Separating Axis Theorem. See the description for more details. Our final entry time is going to be the first component with which we collided with, so take the maximum value of each component's entry time. The exit time is the same story, but with the last component with which we collided with, so take the minimum value instead. If the entry time is greater than the exit time, there obviously won't be any collisions taking place. Place. The final step of this function is getting the normal vector with which we collided with the static collider, which we'll use in just a bit for collision response. Trivial stuff really, if a component of the velocity vector is positive, then we're going to collide on the negative side and vice versa. And obviously we only want that component of the normal vector if that's the axis on which we collided first. Phew, okay, but we're not done yet. In our entity class, let's create a collider for the entity and an update collider function to update the entity's collider with the current position, width, and height of the entity. Now in our update function, we must compute the collisions for the entity by first updating the collider. Now, we could compare our collider with every single block in the world, but that would be needlessly inefficient, because there are a lot of blocks that we know perfectly well will have no chance of colliding with us. So we perform what is known as a broad phase, which knocks out every block which isn't in the range of blocks formed by our current position and our position added with our velocity, plus some margin. I've added a collider's property to each block model, which you can download from the GitHub repo and generate instances of collider in blocktype.py. This makes it possible for blocks to have more complex colliders than just cubes. We then get the block number for each block in the broad phase range, continue if it's air, and otherwise, go through each one of that block type's colliders. Collide our entity's collider with that collider shifted by the block position, and if the normal is not none, add to a list of candidate collisions. Finding these candidate collisions is what's known as a narrow phase, as opposed to a broad phase. Now, get the collision with the smallest entry time, and for each component of the normal vector, set its corresponding component in the velocity vector to zero. This makes sense if you think of our entity's energy being completely transferred to the block it's colliding with. Then we move our position forwards by the velocity multiplied by the entry time. I'm subtracting a small value from the entry time to serve as padding, and collisions should now work. And indeed, they do! 
Kinda. You have this very relatable moments where things look like they're working fine at first, and then you realize that no, things are not working fine, and you have yet another gotchedly darn edge case. Fortunately for us though, this edge case is reasonably easy to think about and solve. As you can see, things go to hell when we're colliding with two colliders at a time in a corner. This kind of makes sense because for each step of our simulation, we're actually only checking for collisions once. So if by chance we were colliding on a second axis at the same time, well, then tough luck. We wouldn't detect that and we certainly wouldn't respond to that. The solution to this is to slap everything inside of a big old for loop which runs three times. Three times because we three axes we can process the collisions off before we don't have any more velocity left at all. And now collisions work perfectly. As a bit of final turds polishing, we can add a new try set block function in world.py which takes in a collider argument to check whether or not placing that block will intersect with that collider. This is naturally useful to check if we're trying to place a block where the player currently is and to prevent that if we are. And that's pretty much it for collisions. This episode has been seven months in the making, way before even episode 11 came out, and honestly trying to explain the collisions in a fairly intuitive and non-infuriating way was a real pain in the ass. So let me know how I did. Truly, collisions are really not a subject that excites me, so I'm glad to finally get this over with and be able to move on to some more amusing episodes.